안녕하세요. 영어로 윤사들을 소개하겠습니다. It's my pleasure to welcome David Damanik, uh, our first plenary speaker today. Okay. Um, David has studied mathematics and computer science at Frankfurt University. And uh, after a PhD in 1998, he went as postdoc to Caltech and uh, stayed there uh, seven years as a postdoc and then became associate professor at Rice University. And uh, he has since then stayed at Rice University where he's currently full professor. He has received numerous awards. Let me just mention the Simons Fellowship in 2012 and the Best Paper Award from the Annal Henri Poincaré. Um, he's currently also fellow of the American Mathematical Society and uh, I'm looking very much forward to hear his talk about the KDV equation with almost periodic data. Please give him a warm applause. Oh, so actually that's, uh, can you open it? Okay, so thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Um, also, uh, it's a great honor to uh, give this talk, and I'm grateful to the organizing committee for the opportunity. Um, so I will talk about the KDV equation, and I'll be especially interested in almost periodic uh, initial data, and uh, specifically about the Dyfed conjecture, which states what should happen in, in that scenario. Okay, so let me uh, show you the uh, KDV equation. This is what it looks like, and it describes waves in shallow water, and it's named after... Uh, Kortovic and de Vries, even though Boussinesq actually considered uh, the equation earlier. And so one reason why the KDV equation is uh, quite well known is because it admits solitons. Um, solitons are solutions that do not change their shape, but rather travel um, without uh, doing so. And so here's uh, a very simple example of a soliton. Um, and so you see it's it really will not change its shape, but rather just uh, move, in, in this case, to the right at constant speed. And so here's a, a picture that depicts that behavior. So the initial state is the red line here. And so these are um, uh, graphs of the solution at later times. And so uh, the uh, figure here is taken from a uh, Oberwolfach snapshot that's uh, being written currently by Jake Fillman and Tom Vandenboom, and they allowed me to use the picture here. Um, so the uh, goal of the talk is to talk about different solutions, not solitons, which vanish at infinity, but rather uh, extended waves. And so, of course, uh, the first case that you would want to consider is the case of uh, periodic initial data. So let's look at the Cauchy problem, and the initial datum will be denoted by V of X for reasons that will become clear in a moment. And so there is an old result from 1976 by uh, McKean and Trubowitz, uh, which tells you uh, what the behavior of the solution is if you start with a, with a uh, periodic function at time zero. Okay? So if your initial function, uh, V of x, is periodic, then the equation admits a global solution, and the solution will stay periodic in space, but the behavior in time will not uh, necessarily be periodic, but it will always be almost periodic. So in 2008, uh, Percy Dyfe uh, suggested to look at a more general setting to uh, consider initial data that are not necessarily periodic, but almost periodic. So the question is whether you have uh, the same uh, behavior in the sense that uh, you have global solutions that retain the type of structure in space and behave almost periodically in time. Okay, so if you start off with an almost periodic uh, initial function V, then you would like to prove that there is a global solution that stays, of course, now almost periodic in X, and uh, the time dependence will be almost periodic as well. So that's what the Dyfe conjecture says, and uh, almost nothing about this conjecture is, is easy. So already, the very first question that you would ask before even answering these more advanced questions here is if you have local existence. And the answer is it's not known in this generality. So this talk will be about the Dyfe conjecture. So again, it's KDV equation 
with almost periodic initial data. And the goal would be to show um, whether you can prove a global existence, maybe a uniqueness statement uh, in a certain sense, and then you would like to understand the time evolution in the sense specified by the conjecture, namely that the uh, behavior is almost periodic in space and time. All right, so let me just recall uh, what almost periodic functions on R are. And so there are a number of ways you can uh, look at that concept. So uh, Bohr's definition of an almost periodic function uh, explains the terminology. So a um, periodic function is one that if you translate it by a suitable, non-trivial amount, you get the same function back. That's what periodicity means. Almost periodicity just means that you get it almost back. Okay, so for suitable translates, you want to get your function almost back. Now the question is in which sense? In which sense should it be close? And it's uh, in the L infinity norm. So the Bohr, uh, let me actually show the, um, whole definition. The Bohr uh, almost periodicity definition says that if you want a translate of your function uh, to be close, you can arrange that by uh, choosing t suitably. Closeness is in the supremum norm, and you can make it as close as you want. I know the question is, uh, for uh, which t's can you get that? So you have to fix your epsilon first, and then the t's for which you have it are relatively dense. So the set of all the t's for which you are with an epsilon, um, the gaps between consecutive such t's are uniformly bounded. The uniform bound will depend on epsilon. That's what the C epsilon is about. So this is the Bohr definition. It really explains the terminology. You're really almost periodic. So for a relatively dense set of translates, you're as close uh, to the original function as you want to be. Bochner's definition uh, says the following. So you look at all the translates, and now you take uh, any subsequence, and you want to be sure that you have a convergent subsequence again in the L infinity norm. Or put differently, if you look at the set of translates, take closure in L infinity, it's a compact set. This compactness uh, already makes the link uh, to the third way of, of viewing almost periodic functions. Um, <clears throat> so the compact set actually carries an abelian group structure. Um, and so once you uh, study that uh, group a little bit, then in this particular setting, this is uh, how actually we will view almost periodic functions. So the group in question here will be uh, T infinity, by which I mean the following. So T is R mod Z. So that's the circle written in additive notation. T infinity is just a countably infinite, countably infinite product of, of these circles. Okay, R mod Z to the natural numbers if you want. So that's uh, what it is. And so on that object, you have a translation flow. So you have a direction vector, and then you just flow in that direction. And then along this orbit, you sample with a continuous function, u. Okay? So this third way of viewing almost periodic functions, that's uh, the view we will take for this talk. So when we investigate the dive conjecture, and we would like to show that solutions are almost periodic in space or time, really what we're thinking of, well, we want to find this infinite dimensional torus, we want to find a translation flow on it, and then we want to find this continuous sampling function that produces the function that we want to identify as almost periodic. That's the point of the slide. And so let's keep that in mind. Okay, so the dive conjecture, again, addresses the KDV equation with almost periodic initial data, claims global existence and almost periodicity in space and time. And so for the rest of the talk, what I want to do is I want to explain a perspective on this problem. Okay, so this perspective leads to results. I will state results. I will sweep some of the assumptions under the rug, but I will tell you what the assumptions are for. But I do want to explain what the perspective is that has been developed. And uh, I will primarily focus on the main players and the connections between them, okay? So the result uh, that can be proved is the following. So you take your initial datum, it's called B for the following reason, this is well known. So the KDV equation gives rise to an isospectral flow. Isospectral what? You take the V, use it as a potential for a shredding operator, then you evolve in time, and then at a later time you look at your solution as a function of X, use that as a potential for a shredding operator, and the spectrum has not changed. That's the isospectrality property. So therefore I call it V because it's the potential of a Schrodinger operator. 
So this is what it is. You take your V, which is your, your initial datum for the KDV equation, but you use it as a multiplication operator, add it to the one-dimensional Laplacian. This now you want to realize as an operator in L2 of R, and you choose a domain that makes itself a joint. So now you have a, an unbounded self-adjoint operator in L2 of R. As such, it will have a spectrum. It will have spectral measures. I won't talk about spectral measures, but they are there. Um, <clears throat> and so you want to make assumptions about V in terms of the spectral properties of this operator. And therefore, this result should really be viewed as an inverse spectral theory perspective on this particular PDE problem. And so what are the spectral properties uh, we're looking for? Well, we look at the spectrum of this operator, and it has to have certain thickness properties. And again, I will probably not tell you what they are, but I will tell you why we need them. Okay, so these spectra for almost periodic potentials tend to be Cantor sets. There are thick Cantor sets, there are thin Cantor sets. So the Cantor sets that uh, we can treat in this problem uh, are of the thicker variety. Okay, so that's one thing. That's about the spectrum, and the spectral measures, they should be absolutely continuous. So again, I will not introduce spectral measures, but they have the standard decomposition into an absolutely continuous piece, singular continuous piece, and pure point piece, and we just need the absolutely continuous piece to either be the only piece or at least be fully supported. Okay, so this is uh, in terms of the assumptions on V. Um, and so once you can verify the assumptions, what you get is basically what you want. So first of all, you have a global solution. That's the first statement in the Dive conjecture. The second uh, statement is that you stay almost periodic in space for each time. And the third statement is that you're almost periodic in time for each x. Okay, so we can verify all the statements of the Dive conjecture under suitable spectral assumptions about the operator associated with this initial datum V, and we also get a uniqueness statement. So the uniqueness is such that the solution uh, whose existence we prove is unique among all solutions that have this boundedness property. So it's, it's uniform in X, but not uniform in T. So for each T, you can have a different upper bound on the L infinity norm of uh, the solution and its derivatives. And in fact, uh, the point here is the following. The solution that we find, because it's almost periodic, is actually uniformly bounded in X and T, okay? So it's stronger than the sense that we require for the uniqueness statement, but that's exactly the point. So this bounded solution is the only one among those that have these weaker bounded uh, assumptions. So if you have any non-uniqueness property at all, uh, this has to fail. And actually, there are examples known that show that uh, such solutions exist. Okay, so you have existence globally, you have a certain type of uniqueness statement, and you have the almost periodicity that you're looking for. So this is the first theorem, um, which reduces things to the verification of certain spectral properties. And of course, you really have to demonstrate that uh, those are properties that can be verified, right? That shouldn't be an empty theorem. You need at least one uh, interesting application. So here's one example, and if there's time at the end, I will actually uh, talk a little bit more about the potential existence of more examples, or rather the boundary of how far you can push this uh, approach. Okay, so quasi-periodic functions are a special uh, class of almost periodic functions. So I told you an almost periodic function is obtained by continuous sampling along translation on an infinite dimensional torus. If the sampling function only evaluates what's going on on a finite number of components, then you can actually restrict your translation to this finite dimensional torus, and then the result is a quasi-periodic function. So quasi-periodic functions are those that are obtained by continuous sampling along orbits of translations on finite dimensional tori. Okay, and so what we need is that the um, function, this continuous function u, uh, actually is analytic. So this is expressed in terms of exponential decay of the Fourier coefficients. Uh, we also need it to be small, so there is a small epsilon in front of it, and this uh, translation vector here, the frequency vector, has to be Diophantine. So here's a Diophantine condition, so it's not actually necessary to parse all of that. So this frequency vector has to have a certain property which is uh, obeyed by almost all frequency vectors. It just means that you don't come back to um, the origin uh, very fast. And so then it's uh, a so-called perturbatively small case the epsilon, which we need small, actually has to be small uh, as a function of the Diophantine condition and the decay rate here. So anyway, 
So there are small quasi-periodic functions where the sampling also happens with a analytic function. And so for these uh, special cases, we can verify these spectral conditions. Namely, the spectrum is thick, the spectral measures are absolutely continuous. We can apply the first theorem, and we get all the properties we want, uh, global existence, certain type of uniqueness, almost periodicity in space and time. And in fact, we can prove a little bit more. Uh, so to you, it's just a change of one word. To us, it's 100 page, uh, pages of work. So. Uh, because you start with a quasi-periodic function, remember the, the spirit in which the dive conjecture acts is that the space structure actually doesn't change. So it's desirable to show that as you evolve along the KDV flow, uh, you stay quasi-periodic and we can prove that, actually with the same frequency vector and everything, and roughly the same uh, analyticity class. So, uh, so this word quasi-periodic is a little stronger than in the previous general theorem that tells you in general you're just almost periodic. So to prove more, you actually have to work more. And so this is possible in this particular case. Okay, so I've explained what the dive conjecture is, what the goal is. Uh, I told you that I want to explain a perspective and I've just given you basically two theorems that can be proved if you implement that perspective. All right, so the rest of the talk really is about the perspective. What should the perspective actually give you? Remember, what we're looking for is, first of all, a way of proving existence of a solution. Where does it even come from? And second of all, where does the almost periodicity come from? We need to produce this torus, and we need to produce a translation flow on that torus. So this really is what I would like to explain. Okay, so the next slide uh, introduces reflectionless operators which may look technical, but that's actually the crux of the problem. That's the absolutely key definition, and I will tell you in a moment why it's the key definition. Okay, so remember, our functions we really want to use as potentials for trading operators. So if you take uh, your V, use it as a multiplication operator added to the one-dimensional Laplacian, you get an operator in L2 with a domain that makes itself a joint. And so now what? You look at Zs for which you can invert H, V minus Z times the identity. Those Zs belong to the resolvent set. So you look at the inverse. The inverse acts as, a, as an integral operator, as a continuum infinite matrix in some sense. And these are the matrix elements, it's also called the Green's function. And <clears throat> so here's the key definition. It looks technical, but I will tell you why it's really important. Uh, you take uh, Zs in the upper half plane. By the self-adjointness, uh, the spectrum is uh, contained in the real line. So as soon as you move off the real line, you're assured that these inverses exist. So you take uh, some z in the upper half plane, and then you send the imaginary part down to zero. And so this denotes a boundary value, and these boundary values exist almost everywhere. So for almost every e and r, actually this boundary value where you send the imaginary part uh, to zero uh, will exist. And then you look at the real part and you want it to be zero. So you want to have purely imaginary boundary values and you want this for Lebesgue almost every point in your spectrum. That's the definition. Okay, and then you say, uh, if you have that, then you will say that V belongs to RS. So RS uh, is the collection of all potentials that are reflectionless on the spectrum S of the associated operator. That's terminology. Okay, so now let me explain why it's important to find this definition. So it's well known by work of Peter Lacks, and I've pointed it out before, that the KDV evolution gives rise to an isospectral evolution when you consider these Schrodinger operators. So whatever the KDV equation does, if a solution exists, will move on the isospectral object. Okay, so that's good. Uh, so in principle, what you would like to do is you take your initial condition, you form the operator, you look at the spectrum, and then you look at all the objects that have the same spectrum. If the solution exists, it has to flow through these uh, objects. Um, and the thing is, the isospectral general object is too big. That's really the problem. You can already uh, see that if V is zero. If V is zero, the spectrum is the um, half line from zero to infinity. And there are many, many, many Vs that lead to that spectrum. And really, most of them will not be relevant at all to the KDV evolution with initial condition zero. So the space is too big. So you need to respect, uh, sorry, you need to restrict your isospectral object. And the way we restrict it is to require reflectionlessness. That's the point. 
So the point of this definition is to find the right restriction of the global isospectral object to something more manageable, and as it will turn out, this more manageable thing is an infinite dimensional torus. And there you go. This is where the infinite dimensional torus will come from. So without having this definition, you don't see the torus, and then you don't have an inkling of why the evolution should be almost periodic. That's why it's really central. All right, so <clears throat> with our assumptions of uh, absolute continuity of the spectral measures and almost periodicity of the initial V, uh, Remling actually showed that V lies in R of S. So in other words, if you have an almost periodic V with absolutely continuous spectrum, then um, you have this property here. So V lies in R of S. And by the way, this is really what you need. You just need that the AC spectrum is equal to the spectrum. You don't need purely AC spectrum, but that's a technicality. All right, so R of S is a set of all Vs so that the operators associated with it are uh, reflectionless on their spectrum, and the spectrum has to be equal to S. And so I will build uh, this, uh, this diagram here over the course of the remainder of the talk. So it, it starts off in a very modest way. So we've just defined R of S. It's currently a collection of Vs, a collection of potentials, a collection of functions. Okay? However, this uh, result by Ramling allows us to put V in R of S. Okay? So turning it around, if you have your KDV problem about which Dyft says something, uh, form the operator, define S to be the spectrum, look at R of S, all the isospectral reflectionless objects, and then we know that V is inside this, this, this universe. Okay, so that's the start of my uh, diagram. All right, <clears throat> so let me tell you about two properties of reflectionless potentials. Um, so if you take your set S, which is supposed to be the spectrum of your operator, but you could also just start uh, with a set and consider the operators that have that spectrum. No one prevents you from doing that. Uh, so the spectra that appear here, they will be bounded from below and unbounded from above just because those potentials are bounded and the Laplacian has a spectrum that is bounded from below and unbounded from above that's preserved under uh, these perturbations. So if it's bounded from below and unbounded from above, you form the convex hull which looks like that and then you take away everything that you've added, namely the gaps. So you view your set as half-line minus uh, open intervals. These are the uh, bounded components of the complement of your spectrum, also called gaps of the spectrum, okay? And so, of course, uh, the concept of finite gap length just says that the uh, length of these gaps are summable. That's what it means. And so here uh, are two results. The first one uh, is by Sodin and Yuditsky. They uh, showed that if you have an S that has finite gap length and it's homogeneous, I will not actually tell you what that is, it's, again, one of these thickness properties. Uh, then every element in R of S is almost periodic. Okay, and the second result is by Gestesian Yuditsky. That says that, again, uh, finite gap length homogeneity of the spectrum, or the set S, then the Schrodinger operator actually has purely AC spectrum. If you compare that with the previous result, it said, if you're almost periodic and absolutely continuous, then you're reflectionless. These results say if you're reflectionless, then you're almost periodic and absolutely continuous. So in some sense, it's a version of a converse. But that's actually not the primary point of this slide. The primary point of the slide is the following. Um, it's this result of Sodin and Yuditsky because it proves an almost periodicity statement. And it turns out that the way they prove the almost periodicity of every element in R of S is exactly the uh, strategy that we sort of implement to prove almost periodicity in time of the KDV evolution. Okay, so this really uh, is very suggestive of what one should try to attack Dyft conjecture, at least in the reflectionless case, where you will see a torus arises. Okay, <clears throat> so here you go. So let me explain uh, what this torus is. It's called the torus of Dirichlet data. And so you start off with your set, uh, you view it as half-line minus uh, complement, um, and then what you do is you have a, a collection of gaps, and of course it's at most countable, but it also could be finite. So J is an index set that's either finite or it's, it's countable, uh, but for each of these uh, gaps, you basically draw a circle, 
and then you take the product of these circles. That certainly is a torus, and it's called the torus of Dirichlet data. Looks trivial, but okay, so let's see. So again, so the torus of Dirichlet data, data is obtained by associating a circle with each gap, and then to take the product of these circles, that produces a torus. Okay, so let me be a bit uh, more precise here. Uh, so take any x and r, and look at our Green's function. So these are now the diagonal elements. Uh, x will be fixed and e will run. And actually, if you run it through a gap where the inverse certainly exists because it's gap of the spectrum, uh, by this uh, monotonicity property that follows uh, quite easily, uh, the following is true. If you have any zero at all because you're strictly increasing, it has to be a unique zero. And so if there is a zero, this unique uh, zero you will call m, uh, sorry, mu j of x. Okay, the, the x is uh, where you look at your uh, diagonal element of your Green's function, and the j is the uh, index of your gap. It's the jth gap. Okay, so if you have a zero in the jth gap of the diagonal Green's function xx, then this is what mu j is. Of course, if you have an interval and you have a strictly increasing function, it's possible that they don't cross through the real line, but rather either stay above it or stay below it. If you stay above it, then you take the best approximation of a zero, namely the left endpoint, because this is where you're closest to zero. And similarly here, if you like this and stay below, this is how, as close to zero as you can get, so you will take this. So the mu j of x is exactly the right endpoint if you're always below, and the left endpoint if you're always above. So if you have a zero, you call it mu j of x. If you have no zero, you take your best approximation to a zero. That's the definition of mu j of x. Okay, so let me explain why it's called Dirichlet data. So you take your x, you impose a Dirichlet uh, condition at x that decouples the problem into two half lines, each with a Dirichlet condition at x. Okay, so now you have two half line problems and you can ask whether either of them has an eigenvalue of this Dirichlet half line operator at uh, this energy, this one here. Uh, and the answer is, well, yeah, if, if you are a zero of the Green's function, then precisely one of them will have an eigenvalue there. Okay, so that's why these really are Dirichlet eigenvalues of half-line restrictions. Um, and so this will then lead to the circle. So first of all, uh, if you have a zero, which means that the mu j is in the open interval, then there is a half-line for which this energy is a Dirichlet eigenvalue. But because it's a unique choice of this half-line, the other one won't have that property. You also should indicate whether it's, the, it's at plus infinity or minus infinity. Okay, so you get an extra variable, sigma j of x, that tells you whether you're on the right half line or left half line, a Dirichlet eigenvalue. And so now, you, there you go. So you have your initial gap, which is an open interval. And now with this plus minus extra variable, you copy that into two intervals. So you have two intervals that are copies of your gap. Uh, but at the end points, you don't have this funny Dirichlet condition, so you don't make the distinction between left and right. And so therefore, there is no plus or minus, which means that you uh, have to identify them. Okay? So you start off with a gap, copy it twice, identify the endpoints, and lo and behold, you see a circle. Really, you see a rectangle at this point, but think of it as a circle. Okay? So that's the circle that you associate with a jth gap. You do it for every gap, you take the product, you get a torus. There you go. Okay, so now that you have this torus, uh, D of S, uh, we can define the following map from these reflectionless functions to this torus by just uh, mapping V to this sequence here. We map it to mu j of zero, sigma j of zero. Okay? So for each j, we have a point on the uh, jth circle. Um, and so that defines a map that we will denote by B. And so here is something that we want. We want this map to be a homeomorphism. Again, for reasons that will become clear in a moment. And so this is a point where we need assumptions. So the homogeneity assumption that I've mentioned but not defined will ensure that this map is a homeomorphism. Okay, so that's the definition of B and D of S. Uh, and here's a remark that's important because uh, this is what Sodin and Yuditsky used to prove almost periodicity of the translation. Um, so rather than looking at these variables, of course we have also defined those. Okay, so this is for x equal to zero, but you can look at other values of x. But a different value for x is just the zero for the translate of uh, v by x. Okay, so if you translate v by x, what used to be x is now zero. Okay, so therefore, uh, if you look at this here, this really is the Dirichlet datum of the translate of v, 
And so the flow on the Dirichlet torus, where you just flow by evolving x, is conjugate via this map b to the translation flow on r of s. That's a really important point. And let me augment my diagram. So I told you this is uh, what we started with. We've now defined the torus of Dirichlet data, d of s, and this map b. And uh, we have a translation here, which is easy to see to preserve the uh, reflectionlessness properties, therefore you stay inside here. And of course, if you flow here and push forward by B, you get some evolution here. But we've just seen what the evolution is, namely you just replace zero by X in the mu J's and sigma J's. Okay, so we have a pretty good uh, understanding of what translation here corresponds to on the Dirichlet torus. Okay, <clears throat> so, the next uh, thing is to uh, use that. So in the KDB case, we have our initial datum V, and we would like to show that under KDB evolution, we get some flow. We don't know that the flow exists. We don't know how it behaves. For the translation, we know what it is, okay? We have our V, and then we just shift it, and it's absolutely clear what the translation flow on R of S is. Nevertheless, we can push it forward by B to this torus of Dirichlet data, and Craig has studied the resulting uh, flow on the torus, okay? So the evolution of the mu j's is actually given by um, this system of coupled uh, ODEs that are very explicit, okay? So if you wanted to study the translation flow in a very circumvent way, you push it over to the torus, evolve the Dirichlet data according to these equations, and then go back via this, uh, what's called the trace formula. So once you know the evolution of the mu j's, you can recover uh, your uh, translated potential at zero. Okay, so this sounds weird, but it's for us extremely useful. Okay, because uh, if we want to now replace translation flow by KDV flow, on R of S we don't know what it is. So we push it over to the other side and ask, uh, what flow we have there, and we try to mimic the same thing. We will try to find the replacement of the right-hand side, and then again, we have to go back via the trace formula. Okay, so this is Craig's result about the translation flow pushed forward to the Dirichlet torus, and how to study it there using these de Bowen flow equations. Okay, so the next uh, input is a result of Wipkin, and for us, again, it's very useful. So let me tell you what it says. Uh, so this is where the condition in our uniqueness statement will come from. So the assumption is here that you start with a solution of the KDV equation. So I really need to emphasize, we don't even know local existence yet. This is a major assumption. We don't know existence yet, but we assume a solution exists. Okay? And if it exists and has these additional properties, then the result says uh, it, if it starts off being reflectionless, it stays reflectionless. Okay? just like in Vegas. So if you reformulate things uh, in our language, uh, if you start off uh, with a V in RS, then uh, for uh, the evolved guy, you stay in RS for every T. So that allows us now to push over to uh, the torus side. Okay, so let me, oh sorry, okay. So what do we have now? We have, uh, let me actually, oh, sorry, okay. I don't have my diagram here. So we have R of S, the reflectionless functions. We have the torus. We have the KV evolution that we want to show actually exists. And we have something that we could push the evolution forward to using the map B. Okay, so now our goal is to study what that evolution would look like, right? Craig showed us how to uh, study that for the translation. We want to know what it looks like uh, for KDV. And so this is our first proposition. So suppose you have a solution of the KDV equation so that Wipkin tells you you stay reflectionless. Because you stay reflectionless, you can apply your map B and now you're fi you find yourself in the torus. Um, and so this um, proposition tells you the Dirichlet data, the mu j of x's and sigma j of x's evolve according to similar coupled ODEs. Okay, so this is a Dubrovin type flow. It's of course a different flow, but the idea is that uh, there is a replacement to the equations I showed you in um, Craig's uh, result. Okay, so, <clears throat> all right. So now, uh, the homogeneity assumption I mentioned is important. 
for uh, the map B to be a homeomorphism. This is really important if you want to go back and forth between the different viewpoints, reflectionless functions, torus elements. The other assumptions that we need to impose uh, are necessary to ensure that these Dubrovin or Dubrovin type equations have solutions, because that's why we do this. We want to show that the KDV equation has a solution we don't know how, we push it over here, and here we want to show that there exists a solution. If we can prove that, then we can pull it back and find our solution here. Okay, so the other assumptions are very explicit assumptions that are just read off from the equations that are produced here and are sort of left implicit. But once you write down the equation, you know what you need to assume about your EJs, the gap structures. Uh, and this is exactly what uh, the unspecified conditions in our first theorem are. Okay, so let me uh, show you uh, the next result. So, <clears throat> again, this uh, is the following. So you have your Dirichlet uh, torus, you have your initial f, and of course the initial f will be uh, the image of your v in question. Okay, so for v, you would like to understand um, what KDV and translation do to it. So we push over, and now we want to solve uh, the Dubrovin and Dubrovin type equations. So this is the Dubrovin uh, equation here, or rather the, the, the vector field resulting from it, for the translate, for the, for the x variation, and for the t variation, the KDV flow, it's this the Bovin type vector field that are produced in the previous results. Uh, and so our second proposition says, well, because we assume uh, assumptions on S that ensure that these right-hand sides satisfy Lipschitz conditions, I have solutions and they are unique. Uh, and so once I have these solutions, I can plug them into the trace formula and produce my function. Okay, so again, the spirit is the following. We have a V, we view it as reflectionless, we embed it in the family of reflectionless guys, we associate via homeomorphism a torus, we push everything over, we ask ourselves what translation and KDV here would correspond to here, we understand that question. Now that we have an explicit system of coupled OBDEs, we sh show that they are solvable, uh, and then we pull it back via this trace formula. That's the whole idea. So in terms of the existence, the global existence statement, this uh, is it basically. So this explains why global solutions exist, because they exist on the torus and because we can pull them back. All right, so here is where we currently are. Uh, we have defined reflectionless Dirichlet torus homeomorphism between them. We have this Dubrovin type flow that would correspond to KDV evolution here. We show that it has solutions and then we pull back the solutions, and that really defines the trajectories of the KDV flow, and in particular establish global existence of solutions under uh, the assumptions on V uh, that are left implicit in the first theorem. Okay, but it's, it's a pretty big subclass uh, of the ones that Dive, uh, Dive addresses in its conjecture. So this is the picture that explains global existence, and so, of course, what's left is the almost periodicity statement. We have a torus, uh, we want to show almost periodicity, uh, we do have a torus here, and we have a continuous function here, so that if we pull back, we have a continuous function applied to some a flow on a torus. There's something missing. To get almost periodicity, we need to apply a continuous function to a translation flow on a torus. This flow is not a translation flow at all. So the question is, where do we see um, the torus on which uh, it is a translation? And this is the remainder of the talk. There is a different way of viewing that same torus. Okay, and so if you do that, then the um, trajectories will become trajectories of translation. And so uh, this is obtained by the so-called generalized Abel map. Uh, and so this was worked out, especially in this infinite genus case that corresponds to the presence of infinitely many gaps uh, by uh, Sodin and Yuditsky. And so let me define this torus. So first of all, you take C minus your spectrum. Again, you have these gaps. Uh, and so you look at the fundamental group of that, and so in particular, uh, loops that start off here and then go through a gap and come back, um, those uh, define non-trivial elements in here. And so in particular, uh, you can then, after a few seconds of thought, see that this fundamental group is a free group, and the generators are given precisely by those loops. Simple loops that start off to the left of the spectrum and go through the midpoint of the jth gap. That would be the loop CJ, and these guys uh, generate uh, the fundamental group. So now that you have that, uh, you consider the dual group, the characters, the group homomorphisms into the uh, unit circle. 
Uh, so this is pi one star of C uh, minus S, the dual group to the fundamental group of C minus S. Uh, and so now this, uh, because this is a free group, these characters are determined uh, by what they do on the loops. And so in particular, because you go into the unit circle, uh, you just have to declare which unit circle element uh, CJ is sent to, okay? So such uh, a group homomorphism, therefore, is defined by the sequence AJ. Each of the AJs is a circle element, so therefore, uh, pi one star is exactly the same torus. It's a product of circles indexed by the gaps. Absolutely the same object. Okay, <clears throat> so next thing is that you define a class or family of harmonic functions. You call them CJ. Uh, so they should be harmonic uh, away from S, the spectrum, and uh, should uh, satisfy these boundary conditions. So below the jth gap, they should be zero, and above the jth, uh, jth gap, it should be one. That defines uh, this function uh, sigma j. And so then this generalized Abel map can be written down explicitly uh, using these functions. Um, and uh, uh, the signs that are associated with the, with the elements that you're applying things to. Okay, so this is now a, a map uh, that uh, goes from the Dirichlet data torus to this dual group of the fundamental group of C minus S. This is called the generalized Abel map. And again, and so I will probably, if I have time at the end, come back to this point. Under our assumptions, this is also a homeomorphism. Okay, so now um, this is sort of the, the final proposition that needed to be worked out. If you apply A to the flow that you had here, both the translation flow and the KDV flow, or rather the images under B, um, then you get linear flows. So that's what this says here. Okay, so the image of the two flows in question on this torus under the generalized Abel map are straight lines. There you go. So this completes the picture. So this is what we had. We now have to find the generalized Abel map mapping over to the dual group of the fundamental group of C minus S. And this last proposition tells us that uh, we have a linear flow here. And that now explains why uh, this guy here, so we start off with a V, it's an element in here, and um, changing x, which is translating v, or changing t, which is evolving along the KDV uh, equation, uh, if pushed over here, corresponds to uh, a translation flow. In other words, by viewing the evolution here as the pullback via A inverse and B inverse of this translation flow, because these two guys are homeomorphisms, uh, your evolutions are continuous images of translation flows on tori. Full stop, that's it. Okay, so that was our goal, to view the KDV evolution uh, as a continuous image of a translation flow on a torus, and that's it. So this uh, is the diagram that explains our perspective on the dive conjecture. So again, if you go back, uh, you will see that it was absolutely crucial to uh, assume this reflectionlessness property, which, because we are assuming uh, almost periodicity of V anyway, really is related to the uh, absolute continuity of the associated Schrodinger operator. Okay, so in some sense, we understand the dive conjecture if the spectra are absolutely continuous. Okay, but we also have these additional assumptions that we need to have continuity here, continuity here, invertibility of both guys, and the ability to solve the de Bovin equations here. Okay, so we have these extra assumptions about the spectra just beyond the pure absolute continuity. So therefore, uh, if you want to apply the general result, you have to actually work quite hard to establish uh, these uh, results about the spectra. Uh, and so for this one application that I showed you, we did that, but that actually is 200 pages of proofs. So that's absolutely insane, but it, I mean, without an application, it's really not as worthwhile to, to have that. So therefore, uh, it's a, a very valid question of whether we can somehow relax the assumptions. So in this way of approaching the dice conjecture, the assumptions come in naturally, especially because we uh, show existence of solutions uh, in this intermediate stage here, where we have these explicit coupled ODEs and we want a Lipschitz condition and basically we have it under these conditions. So it's not clear how to get rid of the conditions. So 
There is a more recent work by Eichinger, Vandenboom, and Yuditsky. They cut out the middleman, so you cut out this intermediate torus. Okay? So in principle, uh, you still have some uh, map from here to a torus, uh, and, I mean, if everything actually works, you know this is the torus where the, you see that the translation uh, is, uh, where the evolution is a translation flow. Okay? So in some sense, if you cut out the middleman, you still have enough information if you can work everything out. And so therefore, what they do actually uh, is they prove existence here. Okay? So once you have existence here, it will still be linear. You can pull it back and prove almost periodicity. Uh, the only thing that they don't have is a uniqueness statement here. But what they do have are weaker assumptions, because for the weaker assumptions, you don't need this intermediate thing, which led to these, what we call, correct type conditions. Okay, so this is very nice. Uh, the other comment that I want to make is the following. So if you actually could get rid of all the extra assumptions about the spectrum, and it's really about um, almost periodicity and absolute continuity, then new interesting questions arise, because in uh, the uh, sort of simpler discrete setting, Avila has, uh, this is part of his uh, Fields Metal work, really completely characterized uh, the quasi-periodic uh, operators that have AC spectrum. And this is much beyond what we have with our smallness assumptions uh, that really pushes uh, things to the boundary of where absolute continuity breaks down. And if you could actually get rid of these weaker assumptions that uh, make this approach work, then you could really push it all the way to just assuming absolute continuity. So with this, I close, and thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing your perspective on the dive conjecture with so much energy <laughs> and the perfect time planning. Are there questions or comments? Yes, there's one. So, if I'm not mistaken, <coughs> uh, the, the um, uh, <coughs> isospectral structure can be traced back to the existence of a countable set of invariants that in turn generate a Vera Soro algebra. And now, this countable set of invariants has some resemblance of your torus. So, is there a way, is there a possibility that you actually get some? conformal structure in the picture that sort of say would explain the special nature of these solutions? So I don't have a good answer. So I think uh, sort of in the classical approach, uh, the uh, spectral information that was used was very much attached to uh, the uh, point spectrum or rather the discrete spectrum. So this is basically when you study the problem in Sobolev spaces and look at solitons arising or associated with uh, discrete eigenvalues. So the thing here is that you in general, or really always, don't have them. So really your spectral information is encoded in these uh, endpoints of the gaps and these Dirichlet eigenvalues. So that is neither a yes or a no, uh, I, I just don't know, okay? I'm, I'm just saying that the type of spectral information that you're using uh, is somewhat different than uh, in the classical case where you have Sobolev spaces. Thank you. I myself have a, a little question. The program or the perspective, as you called it, that you worked out is particularly worked out for the KDV equation. But in which sense or um, is it also viable for, for other equations? Yeah. Um, right. So whenever you have a lax pair formulation, you have a family of operators that you look at and you can ask similar questions. Uh, so then the question is, can you actually uh, work out all these things? Uh, and so then uh, the fact of the matter is that there has been a lot of work done on quasi-periodic and almost periodic Schrodinger operators. So whenever you can identify conditions on sort of your spectral problem that's relevant to your PDE in question, uh, you have to ask whether you can show these properties, and that's uh, not clear. So as I said, so if you actually want to verify the conditions that we got, uh, it takes 300 pages, given the extensive literature that already exists for Schrodinger operators. So it really depends on which operators you're dealing with and how much you, you know about them. Thank you. So if there's no further question or comment, so let's thank our speaker again. Thank you.